Folklore and the Sea by Horace Beck. This selection is from the chapter on spectral ships. Whatever the reason, the belief in the ghost ship is ancient, widely dispersed, and still accepted. Of them all, the Flying Dutchman is the best known example. To fathom this tale would be a book-length task, but some remarks may be made concerning it, for, of all the folk tales in the world, this is one of the most complicated, oldest, and most widespread. Further, its ramifications have spread far inland and changed more markedly than almost any tale of its kind. Although there are many varied threads spun into the cable of this story, at least four seem to be outstanding. One is the story of the Wandering Jew, another of Ahasuerus the Antichrist. This legend has been adequately treated in a tome by George Anderson. Disregarding numerous earlier antecedents, the stories were well known shortly after the death of Christ and reached fruition before 1600 AD. Briefly, it seems that as Christ was carrying the cross toward Calvary, a certain man railed at him and told him to move on. Christ looked at him and said, I will go, but thou shalt tarry until I return. Since that time, the man has been a wanderer on the face of the earth, unable to die, unable to rest. This man during the Middle Ages became confused with another man, a cobbler named Ahasuerus who was believed to be the Antichrist, a leader of the powers of darkness who had been present at the crucifixion, and who would strive with Christ when he returned a second time. The second thread in the tale comes from the Germanic story of the Wild Hunt. In the beginning, this was a tale about Woden, who, with his retinue, was said to pursue game across the sky. Later, this changed to a ghostly crew mounted on spectral horses, following slobbering, yelling hellhounds in a mad pursuit of a phantom game, usually boars or stags. Finally, it became attached to various people who overindulged in their pastime of hunting. An English version tells about a man named Dando, a sensual priest who loved to hunt. One day, he met the devil who stole his game and refused to return it. Dando swore he would ride to hell if necessary to regain the quarry. Immediately, he was placed on Satan's horse, and away they dashed with the clamoring hounds to hell. Now and then he returns and can be seen tearing across the moor in wild pursuit of his prize. The third strand comes from the tale of a strange murder and penance from the north. For over 600 years, a specter has walked the battlements of Castle Falkenberg, crying, Murder! The specter is accompanied by two lights. Long ago, two brothers lived there and courted the same girl. She married Walderon, and his brother Reginald took it very hard. After the wedding, he secreted himself in a closet in the bridal bedchamber and waited. Shortly thereafter, the bride and groom entered and hopped into the bed. Before their expectations could be realized, Reginald climbed out of the closet and killed the bride. In the struggle, he also killed his brother, who smote him on the cheek with a bloody hand during his death agony. Since water would not remove the mark, ostensibly of Cain, Reginald visited a holy man in the forest who said he must make a pilgrimage to the north. Reginald immediately set forth, and with him went two specters, a white one on the right, a black one on the left. North he went with shade and shadow, until at last he came to the end of the land. In the offing lay a great ship, and no sooner had the fratricide arrived than a wherry put off, and when it reached the shore, the oarsman said, We have been waiting for you. The fratricide and his companions got in and were taken to the vessel, which immediately got under way. Reginald and his two companions went below, where the black shade began dicing with the white for Reginald's soul. 
For 600 years they have been dicing, and mariners to this day aver that through the spindrift and the foam they have seen the great ship with the dicers and Reginald pounding up to windward under full sail. The fourth great strand of the story, which is perhaps the oldest and most resistant to change, is found in the ancient belief in the ability of the dead to participate in the activities of the quick. This, coupled to the almost universal belief that supernatural beings inhabit the turbulent waters about great headlands, completes the strand in Hauser, for it is here, around Cape Horn and Hope, that the greatest of all the spectral ships appears. Our story appears in many forms and guises, but three seem to comprise the root of all the others. The first is the story of Dahul, an Arabic name meaning Forgotten One, who turns up sometimes off Cape Finester. This man was a pirate and had as his chief consort no less a personage than the devil, who came aboard as a stowaway. One day he struck the devil a terrible blow and threw him overboard. Shortly after this, he captured a vessel and found aboard a Spanish family and a priest. Dahul ordered the priest to be crucified and cooked the Spaniard's child. He then laughed at the priest's final agony. Suddenly the sky darkened and a great voice was on the deep. You shall wander, Dahul, at the will of the winds, at the mercy of the waves. Your crew shall exhaust itself in endless toil. You shall wander upon every sea until the end of the centuries. You shall receive aboard all the drowned of the world. You shall not die, nor shall you ever approach the shore, nor the ships which you will always see fleeing before you. Since that day the vessel has wandered. No one sleeps nor eats. She has no water and no hope. She is seen always before a storm, and in the ominous quiet and half-light that precedes a great gale. She drives past under close reefs, her black hull half-buried in a smother of foam. The second tale concerns a huge, powerful Dutch captain named Bernard Folk, who drove his ships beyond the power of humans. To make sure his masts could stand the strain, he encased them in iron bands, he was hard on his men and given to swearing great oaths. His ninety-day passages from Batavia to Holland were so fast and so regular that sailors believed he had made a compact with the devil. However, time means money, even at sea, and his owners loved him. Eventually he failed to return, and it was popularly thought that the devil had called him home. He may still be seen before an approaching gale driving his vessel around the Cape of Good Hope. The final story has two versions. The simpler one states that a Dutch sea captain, Vanderdecker, meaning the cloaked one, tried his best to beat round Cape Horn, but made no progress. At last he made a vow that he would never stop trying until he doubled the Cape, no matter how long it took. He would be damned, as he said, if he did. This was, of course, a direct affront to God, and he has been battling for his westing ever since. The old Cape Horners used to see him before storms in the vicinity of Table Bay, and when he appeared, they knew that dire things waited in the offing. Our more involved story says that God appeared to Vanderdecker as he tried to force his way around Good Hope and told him to stop. The stubborn Dutchman drew his pistol and shot at the master, but the bullet deflected and went through his hand. Vanderdecker attempted to strike God, but his arm fell useless, and his father cursed him. From that day forward, he was to wander all oceans, never reaching port. He would drink gall, chew molten iron, never sleep, have always foul weather. Gales would attend him. His body would become deformed. He would be the evil one of the sea, hated by all. Finally, whenever he was seen by a passing vessel, disaster would attend his passing. Having thus negated every hope and pleasure sought by seamen, the merciful father returned to heaven. The courageous captain said only, I defy you. And since that time has been forced to endure the punishments in his ship, the Voltigeur. Through the interweaving of these three basic tales have come most of the Flying Dutchman's stories. Gathered around these three stories are many beliefs that do nothing to lessen the fame of Dahul, 
folk, or Vanderdecker. Not only do they bring storms, their ships bring plague and madness. They cannot be boarded. They are luminous. If you take letters from them, you are lost. On their decks are seen specters dicing for souls. They make no sound. The figurehead is a skeleton, and specters swarm over their yards. You can hear them many leagues away, and so on. Should you doubt the veracity of their being, they were seen by no less than the two sons of the Prince of Wales. So catching has the idea of the Flying Dutchman become that it has gone ashore and become part of both folk and intellectual endeavor, appearing as an opera by Wagner and as the theme of numerous poems and novels by Scott, Longfellow, Marriott, and Cooper, to name but a few. Among many folk antecedents are Peter Rugg, the missing man, who haunts the Boston Post Road in New England. The hitchhiking ghost, popular around large cities from Philadelphia to San Francisco. The specter stagecoach of the 19th century, and most recently, a specter bus, truck, or automobile, which is forced to wander the better-known highways of the United States. Robert Flaws, a former student who spent two years as a cowboy in the West, informed me that there is even a steer that fits the bill. Like the Judas goat that leads the sheep to slaughter, there is also a Judas steer that is said to lead cattle on the long drive to the hamburger stand. Such a steer was Don Ramirez, an ancient longhorn who was fated to escape the butcher only to wander the prairie, gaunt and luminescent, stampeding cattle before storms and prairie fires. Before closing, it is worth noting that the specter of Vanderdecker's ghost stalked the courtroom in a famous trial in San Francisco a century before. In 1851, the firm of William Webb built the Extreme Clipper Challenge. With her, they planned to establish a speed record to California and made Captain Robert H. Bully Waterman her master. She was a tremendous vessel, and under her new commander carried almost 120,000 square feet of sail, a spread no other commander could make her bear. If the ship was magnificent, her crew were not. They were scraped out of every sink and drain in New York. Further, they were interested in pay and not in ships or records. They apparently did not know Waterman's reputation, and his five-foot-eight stature did nothing to enhance it. None, apparently, took the pains to note his gimlet eyes. Waterman had been chosen to command for a number of reasons. He was known to be fearless, to be the most desperate sail carrier of them all, in an age where the motto among sea captains was, what she can't carry, she can drag. Moreover, he had a record for fast passages from the Orient. In the Natchez, he had made the passage from China to New York in 78 days, he had circumnavigated the world in less than 10 months. He had sailed 385 miles in 24 hours in the Sea Witch and had gone anchor to anchor, Canton to New York, in 74 days. To get the most out of his vessel, Waterman had his halyards padlocked aloft to ensure that no one would lower the sails, and stood aft roaring at God to dare capsize him. As for his crew, he feared them in proportion to his fear of God, and would flatten the first shirker or malingerer with a four-foot persuader he kept lashed to his wrist. Before shipping on, the crew of the Challenge might have done well to have studied their homework. Going around the horn, five men were lost overboard from a yard, and on August 17th, the crew jumped the mate, Black Douglas, and stabbed him. Single-handed, Waterman waded in with his persuader, saved the mate, but disabled the crew. From then on, things went badly, and the challenge arrived in San Francisco after a passage of 108 days. The crew jumped ship, those able to jump, and charged Waterman with inhuman treatment and murder. Waterman, meanwhile, charged the crew with mutiny. During the ensuing trial, the counsel for the seamen, attempted to create a bad atmosphere for Waterman. They pointed to his past records from the Orient, his quick returns to sea, his challenging of God, and averred that, in order to make his vessels bear more sail, he cased their masts in steel. 
In point of fact, they attempted to demonstrate that, like the Flying Dutchman, Waterman was either cursed by God or in league with the devil. Waterman was acquitted, but like the three spectral captains, his career was ruined. He retired to a small ranch and died of peritonitis. Although the Flying Dutchman is the best known and most developed of all the tales of ghost ships, they are sufficiently abundant on the coasts of North America, the British Isles, Ireland, and the West Indies, to make them a hazard to navigation. Nearly all stories about ghost ships seem to have certain things in common. They appear in certain guises as fire ships, as flying ships, in which case they usually soar over land or across points, or as normal ships that do peculiar things or have odd characteristics. They sail backwards, they vanish as they reach land, they carry full sail when others are forced to scud on, under bare poles. They sail dead to windward under full sail. They proceed at a rapid pace under close reefs in a flat calm carrying a living gale with them. Sometimes their planks are gone and only their ribs remain through which the sun can be seen. Their sails are threadbare or totally flogged out leaving only the leech, luff, and bolt ropes. No man stands at the helm, and the crew are sometimes skeletons, sometimes non-existent. Very often, they are luminescent and pass in total silence. <laughs>